once we've collected all the data, all the profiles on our individuals within our squad, we can start to build up a picture of what that squad looks like. And we can look at where the mean of our squad lies, and we can see who's above the mean, who's below the mean, who's tighter, who's faster, who's slower. How do individuals compare to one another? This is particularly useful when we've then got new individuals coming into the programme. We can screen them for the first time, and we know the level we want them to be at, because that's what we want our squad to look like. So again, it allows these targeted interventions from an early stage with a new athlete coming into the programme. Now, where we work at Scottish Institute of Sport, quite often, these athletes are students. So they're university students, 17, 18 years old, 16 in some cases. You're allowed to leave school at 16 in Scotland. If you know it. They're coming in very young. A lot of these guys have never done any structured SNC. They're high-performing athletes for their age, of course. They're coming into the, uh, an elite athlete performance programme, but they've never really had the kind of support that they would get at Sports Scotland. And an S&C programme, you're almost starting from a, a, a blank sheet, which is a really exciting place to be. But if you don't know how to direct that athlete, you just kind of throw things at them and see what sticks. Using the TMG, we can actually plan from a very early stage what does this athlete need to work on? What areas do we need to try and tone up? What areas do we need to speed up? Where might they be lacking in power? How can we change that? We can also then look at comparing different individuals in within the squad, and it might be done by position. So within a hockey, we can look at our defenders, midfielders, forwards. We don't bother with goalkeepers. They don't do anything. Within swimming, it might be different events, might be different disciplines. You can apply this to any sport. You know, it depends what you're interested in. We can then look at them all on top of each other. So we can see that generally, this is displacement here on the, uh, on the x-axis, on the y-axis, sorry. And our forward players generally have greater muscle tone in most muscles than our midfielders or defenders. Why is that? Are they faster? Do they do more running? Do they have more accelerations during the match? Are they stronger? Why would that be? Actually... Are our midfielders and our defenders just not as well conditioned as our forwards? And we need them to be. So we can start to put a context around these measurements as well and start to answer some <coughs> bigger questions about how our squad is made up. And of course, Sergey showed the, the database that exists of different athletes, different sports, and we can compare our squad to the database. So we've got left and right side shown in blue and red. We've got the database shown in white. What we can see from our squad is that generally down posterior chain here, most of the muscles are more toned than the database. Not so much on the anterior. Why is that? Is that something that's a problem? Is that something we need to look at to try and solve? Or actually, is that something that's desirable? And again, we contextualise it. We do a lot of work on the posterior chain in terms of muscle tone, in terms of strengthening, trying to avoid hamstring injuries. So potentially that makes sense, and that's actually something desirable. So if we get athletes that are in that are very close to the norm, we might actually want them to be closer to our squad norm rather than the database norm. Could be the other way around. So using both databases, our own squad and the existing database that's built into the software, can be really, really useful. Now, we've talked a little bit about reliability and validity. I just want to highlight this one paper by... Uh, a good friend of mine, Max de Troilo, and, and some other colleagues from up in Stirling um, helped on this paper. And what they showed was that the reliability of TMG has actually improved somewhat in an exercised or fatigued state versus a rested state. Now, the caveat to that is that the exercise was a series of MVCs, isometric, and the fatigue was electrically induced fatigue on a single muscle. So generally, when we're training, when we're competing as athletes, we're not going to have that kind of rigorous control over the way that the muscle is exercised or the way the muscle is fatigued. We're not going to get that uniform response. But what we know is that we will get fluctuations depending on rested, fatigued, exercised. So when we're building up our profile to try and get a baseline, if you like, it's no good just to have a single measurement. So when we get our athletes in, what we do is measure left and right on our muscle. We get a second measurement and a third measurement. And the way that we did this was three consecutive weeks. So the same time of day, same laboratory conditions, tried to keep external variables as controlled as possible. The only variable we didn't control was 
well, what training had they done? They'd trained, and it was the same time relative to that training, but actually the training load, training volume, had been different because they don't do the same thing week after week after week, day after day after day. And we get that across all our muscles, and we can start to build up this picture where our vastus lateralis here is pretty consistent. There's not really much fluctuation at all. If we look at the bicep femoris, on the other hand, I mean, that's all over the place. You know, that's responding clearly very, very differently from week to week to week, depending on the training loads that have been done. We then get, I'll get it. We then get vastus, uh, the latissimus dorsi down here, where generally we've got good clustering and we have one kind of flyaway measure. Now, is that an outlier? Was there an issue there? Was there potentially an injury coming into play when that measurement was done? Well, we need to know that that muscle can range down to as low as that. And it may be that it was injured, but actually it can go that way. And there was no complaints from the athlete. There was nothing in terms of time off training or anything that was required like that, a physio treatment or rehabilitation. So we have to consider that as a potential normal value for that individual. So once we've got all our measurements, we can then build up a mean and a range. And the range that we use is, is for this with coefficient of variation. So sometimes called the, sta the, the relative standard deviation. And it just seemed to, to work quite well in terms of giving an appropriate sized range for us to work with. It wasn't too large that actually you're never ever going to fall outside of it. And it wasn't too narrow that mm, you can fluctuate outside of that quite easily. So I've put the question up there of what would cause an individual to fall outside of their normal range. And we did this fun little experiment here. So we had one of our swimmers went, did his training session, tested pre and post. You can see there not very much change. There's not been much of an effect of that training session. So the take home message is that I clearly worked much, much harder than the swimmer because um, I've had a much more of an effect. But really someone who's well conditioned and well accustomed to this kind of exercise isn't going to fluctuate an awful lot just on the back of training. You know, Sergey touched on this point earlier. So we wouldn't expect to see massive changes just day to day because they've trained. Maybe in the aftermath, maybe if it's uh, exhaustive, maybe if it's too fatigued, maybe certain phases in training, but your normal day to day loading wouldn't expect to see too much. Whereas in your slightly less well conditioned individual over here, you know, there's a drastic change in the properties of that muscle following the training. So we went on next to track our athletes over a slightly longer period of time. And this time we used three days in a row. And we got them before and after every training session. So we ended up with about 11 or 12 measurements. So it's two, two training sessions most days, one on, on some of the days. And you can just make out, hopefully, the dotted black line is the mean, and then our range is the two dotted gray lines. To tidy that up, I'm actually going to remove all the measurements that were within the normal range. And we're left with these four. So why were these four outside normal range? Well, we can highlight the two at the top, and we can see that these were both before training AM, first thing in the morning. Effectively, just rolled out of bed, driven to the swimming pool, and got tested. So his displacement was low. His muscle tone, his displacement was high, sorry. His muscle tone was low first thing in the morning. He hadn't done any exercise, hadn't done any warm-up, hadn't done any kind of priming. You know, this is just evidence, if ever there was needed, that you shouldn't just go into a training session cold. You need to do some kind of stretching-based, land-based warm-up in order to prime your muscles for the activity. Now, over here, we've got two where the contraction time or the velocity is slightly faster. Displacement's actually within our normal range. These two, both pre-training as well, but afternoon this time. So quite well rested. It wasn't after training. The training had been hours earlier. This was afternoon. One of the times, actually, he didn't have training that afternoon, but before going in. And this starts to build up a picture of how the muscle changes across the course of a day, and we can start to schedule in when would be the best time to perform certain types of training. It's going to be good for him to train there because his displacement is optimal, it's within his range, and his contraction time is fast, his velocity is fast. So that's going to be a great time for him to go in and perform quite well. First thing in the morning, not so much, until he's done his warm-up, until he's done some priming to activate those muscles. 